Hello and welcome to episode 207 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Real Good Foods, Omnipod, Dexcom, and Dancing for Diabetes. Before we get started, let me give you the particulars about our advertisers. To find out more about the Dexcom G6, go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. To try a free no obligation demo of the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump, you can go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. Would you like to save 10% on some real good food? Go to realgoodfoods.com and put in the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. And don't forget to find out more about Dancing for Diabetes. That's dancing, the number four, diabetes.com. In this episode, my guest Ayla will be talking about her time with type 1 diabetes. She's an advocate. She's a child, 14 years old, hello, out speaking for people with diabetes. She's scuba diving, skiing, she does it all. Her mom even has type 1. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before becoming bold with insulin or making any changes to your healthcare plan. And I don't know what you're doing on February 23rd, 2019, but I will be at the Type 1 Nation event at the Desert Willow Conference Center in Arizona. I'm all over this event, so if you want to come out and see me speak, I think I'm in two different breakout sessions, and we're doing a Juice Box podcast live. To find out more, you're going to go to jdrf.org forward slash Arizona forward slash events forward slash type. I'm just kidding. Go to juiceboxpodcast.com, scroll to the bottom, click on the events tab. They'd like it very much if you could RSVP, so don't wait. And I don't usually do this, but I just received an email from Adam in Maryland. Adam, I wanted to let you know I got your email. I'm touched, man. I'm glad you're doing better. Hi, my name is Ayla Kanow. Okay, so Ayla, the so first thing you should know is that when I saw your last name, I didn't know if it was pronounced Kanow or Kano. And I thought, I hope it's Kano because then I'm going to name the episode Now You Kano. But now I can't do that. But that's okay. It's not your fault. <laughs> we'll think of another episode title. All right. You're 14? Yes. Wow. How long have you had type 1? I've had type 1 for over five years. Okay. So you were nine? Yes. Are you pretty impressed with my math? Yeah. I am usually more able to impress children around your age with my math. So uh, <laughs> I'm assuming you're in like uh, algebra or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, see, you're way better at math than I am. Just don't hold that over my head as we're talking for the next hour, okay? All right. So you reached out and you wanted to be on the podcast. And I was like, that's cool. Let's do that. Um, how did you find it? I've found your podcast through Instagram, I'm pretty sure. Nice. That's yeah. excellent. Very nice. I'm very old, so I don't know how to use all the social media that well. And <laughs> anytime I know that it's working, I'm amazed. My children see my likes on things and they make fun of me. <clears throat> so <laughs> that's for everyone listening. You need to like my stuff more or my kids mock me in my own way. So it's, it's, it, if you want to stick up for me, that's one way to do it. What are you doing on Instagram? Are you looking for other people with type one or were you just trolling around or what were you doing? I was just trolling around. I think I saw something on, um, like, Junebug's Instagram or something like that. Right. And I've also heard about your podcast through Beyond Type 1, and it just seemed like a really cool platform that you've been put to, putting together. Cool. And so, and so you checked it out, and you didn't find me too old or boring? No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about the podcast? I just enjoy all the different perspectives and stories that you share and it's just interesting. Ayla, you're 14. You just said different perspectives. I was like, <laughs> if I asked my kid what she likes about something, she'd be like, I don't know. It's fine. <laughs> she, wouldn't, she wouldn't say anything else. Uh, so that's really impressive. Okay. So you've been listening for Thank a while. You. No, please. You're very welcome. Have you been listening for a while? Uh, maybe a few months. Yeah. Oh, cool. What made you want to come on? I spoke at the DYS gala this last fall as their keynote speaker to talk about Bearskin Meadows Camp and Camp de los Niños 
the summer camps that they put on in California. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy public speaking and sharing my story with other diabetics. So I thought this would be another cool way to share my story. Every week I see more likes on the Instagram and Facebook accounts of Dancing for Diabetes, but not enough. I know how many people listen to this podcast. Get out there. Dancingfordiabetes.com. This is going to be like a role reversal because you're way more mature than I am. All right. Well, that's fine. You be the adult, Ayla, and I will, I will act like I'm 14. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. <laughs> what led you to, and I'm sorry, what event did you speak at? Um, DYF Scala, Diabetes Youth Families, Diabetes Youth Foundation. Very nice. Uh, and, yeah. and, and so who did you speak to a big group of people? Was it nerve wracking? Is it worse doing this or was it worse doing that? Or do you just like both? I think it was a lot more nerve wracking to do the gala. Cause you could see the people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm from Colorado and we flew out to San Francisco for it. So it was a pretty big deal. Wow. How did they choose you for that? I'm not sure. They just chose one camper to be the keynote speaker to represent this program for the last 80 years. And I got an email and we made it happen. That's really cool. Congratulations. That's, it's really interesting and fun to be recognized like that. Did it surprise yeah. you when they reached out? Yeah. For sure. But you knew you wanted to do it? Yeah, I had no idea that DYF even had a gala and that this is a thing to, you know, be a keynote speaker at my age. But once I wrote my speech and actually made it happen, it was really amazing. It was super cool. Really great. That's amazing. Did they pay for like your plane and your hotel and all that stuff? Yes. Nice. I think so. That's excellent. Did you do anything cool while you were in California? No, we just flew out for like two or three days. Gotcha. Did your mom go with you? My dad actually your dad came did? with me. Excellent. Yeah. Who's, who's most involved with your diabetes care at home? Is it your mom or your dad or everybody? Everybody. My mom's also type 1 diabetic, so we have a cool bond that way, and so she really understands. But my dad's also really supportive. He gets it, and even my sister. I just... I feel like I have a very tight support system. Wow, that's amazing. How old, Do you know how old your mom was when she was diagnosed? She was 35, I'm pretty sure. She got gestational with me and my sister, and then it came back as just normal type 1. Okay, so we won't ask how old your mom is now because that's not polite, <laughs> okay? But she was 35 when she got it, so she was pregnant with one of you, and you're 14, so she's... Hmm... She about 50? 45. 45? Look at you. Smart. Even <clears throat> if she's 50, say 45. You did a good job there. Do you guys share like management styles or do you do it differently than she does it or do you do it together? How does that work? She is on the Omnipod and the Dexcom and I used to be on the Omnipod and the Dexcom and now I'm on the Medtronic 670G. Oh, you're using the, the 670G. How are you finding it? I just talked to somebody the other day that said they hated it, and I talked to somebody else that said they loved it. One person told me that it's working great for them, and the other person told me that everything it tells them to do, they have to ignore. How's it been working for you? I like it when it works. When <laughs> my, wife, my wife would say that about me, Ayla. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you like it when it works, so when does it not work? Um, I'm actually on my fourth 670. It has broken a few times for me. So when it's in auto mode and it's working, my numbers are pretty steady. But when it doesn't work, it, you have to, you get a lot of alarms. Oh, well, there goes any opportunity I had for Medtronic ads later, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just it's kidding. Still a, it's still a great pump, though. I, I really enjoy it. I'm teasing it's you. It's really good for sports. <laughs> it's for good me. for sports? It keeps you in line for sports? Yeah. Right. Do you think that one day when the Omnipod comes out with their closed loop, do you think you'd go back? Probably. I liked the Dexcom sensor a lot more than I like the Guardian sensor, but the Guardian sensor is still a really nice sensor. It's nice and flat and comfortable, but I liked that you could trick the Dexcom to wearing it longer. 
You know what? I've now decided that all of my product reviews should be with like kids your age because you're incredibly honest. It's perfect. Nobody, I don't have to worry about whether or not you're like, well, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or anything like that. Um, well, that that's really. I'm glad you found something that's working for you. I, I wish it was a little more stable for you, but I'm glad that you found something. Did you have to switch? Were you having trouble with your management? Like, was it bouncing around on you, or is it just something you wanted to try? I wanted to try the Medtronic. I've been back and forth between Medtronic and Omnipod for the last several years. And learning about a closed loop system, I got on the Pathway program. So I got it right when it came out. And I really enjoyed it. So That's excellent. I, I'm very excited for all of the different closed loops that are coming. You know, and yes. it looks like everybody's got their hand in trying to make one. So I think in the next year or so, we're going to probably be inundated with them, which will be great because everybody will have a lot of choices and, and, you know, you'll see how things work and, you know, how they don't work and you'll be able to make a good decision for yourself. Well, that's really cool and, and very proactive of you. You do a lot, right? Like you're incredibly involved in like sort of like activism around type one. Yeah, I'd say so. I think having my mom also be type one diabetic, it's, it's like a, good outlet to like be confident about it and not cover it up so I mean I go to diabetic summer camp every summer and I last year did my first ever JDRF bike race with her and I'm going to do another one this summer um so just having like little things that make you be able to be confident about it I think is really important yeah no, I agree. I, I really do. In any way you can find that is is important. Also, I think it's I think it is um, undervalued by how empowering it can be to just show other people that you have it. To you know, be like, hey, this is my pump. Or like, I remember just a couple of weeks ago, we were at a pool, and um, I looked over and I thought for a split second, like, did I just see like the edge of Arden's butt? Like, what happened? And then I realized later she had pulled her suit down a little bit because somebody asked to see her her Dexcom, and she just she was like, yo, here. And then she, you know, kind of pulled it aside and showed them. Um, and we were somewhere, not somewhere. We were at a softball tournament a couple of weeks ago, and even though Arden didn't get to see the person or actually talk to them, a woman, you know, a grown woman in her forties walked by walking her dog and she had an Omnipod on and a Dexcom. And I looked at, I watched Arden look over at her and you could just see that it, I don't know, I don't want to say it made her happy, but she liked looking and seeing somebody else like her like that, you know? So that's, so you're going out and being really open about it. So other kids can see you. Is that the idea? Yeah. I live in a really small town in Colorado and in the last year there's been three new diabetics. So you're starting a trend, Ayla. I guess. Yeah. One more. You got a basketball team, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like I just need to help pave the way. That's really kind of you, and that's excellent. Uh, so, so we're gonna de- dig in as much as I feel like. I don't want to push you too hard because you're 14, but you also seem really mature. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. It might be a little tough, right? Knowing what it feels like, for instance, to be low or to be high. When you see your mom going through that, how does it make you feel? Um, I know what it feels like, so I feel like we have that connection. So when I'm low, she knows how I'm feeling, and when she's low, I know how she's feeling. So we just sort of we help each other out. Yeah. Do you feel? I'm not. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Do so you feel any way you feel? But does it make you feel like overly compassionate towards her? Does it make you feel like scared for, or sad for, or not? And I'm going to tell you why I'm asking you in a second. So just answer however is honest. Real good foods is real food you'll feel good about eating. Low carb, high protein, real ingredients. Friday night I had the cauliflower pizza. Now what is that? It's a pizza but the crust is made out of cauliflower. I don't know how they do it. It's amazing. It tastes like pizza, which throws you off because, well, I mean, you wouldn't think, you know? But anyway, this is a pepperoni pizza that I really enjoyed. I tossed it in the oven, bada bing, bada boom. Next thing you know, I'm pizza it up. Now, I almost went with the three cheese pizza with the chicken crust, almost. 
I was this close, but I wanted the pepperoni. But next time I'm gonna do it because the three cheese, right? Large three cheese pizza with the chicken crust, 50 grams of protein, eight grams of carbs per pizza. They're absolutely grain and gluten free. All natural chicken breast crust. You can buy a case of them. You get eight pizzas in a case. And don't forget at checkout to use the offer code JUICEBOX to save 10% on your entire order. Real Good Foods is also offering free two-day shipping, so take advantage. Real Good Foods has variety packs. They have snacks, poppers, enchiladas, the chicken crust pizza that we talked about, and the cauliflower crust pizza that I just had Friday. Go over, take a look, see what you think. Realgoodfoods.com. Don't forget to use the coupon code juice box at checkout to save 10%. And let's be honest, to support the podcast. Okay, we're going to get back to Ayla. She's going to answer my question about how she feels seeing her mom live with type 1. I think it's just normal. I mean, there's lots of highs and lows when you're diabetic. So having two people in the family go through that, it's just sort of like a new normal and we help each other out. Cool. So. so do you have any idea why I asked you that? Not really. Okay. I want the people who are listening to hear your perspective, which is this is just normal. And so for all the people who don't have type 1 who watch a loved one with it, and when they see them get high or low, they, they're they often hit with an incredible amount of guilt and sadness. And I really wanted them to hear from you that it wasn't necessary for them to feel that way. So that's why I asked you that kind of leading question. But at the same time, I'm, I expected you to answer the way you answered. I, I appreciate you being honest. You really are good at this. Thank you. You're very welcome. So Colorado, are you four, you're 14? Am I like, you're old enough for me to joke. Is your whole town just like weed dispensaries or what, what's going on out there? No, not really. I live in Telluride, the small ski town. Very nice. That, so are you guys, do you, like, how does that work? I mean, do you, are you skiing constantly? Is that a big part of your life or do you, have you never skied? Yeah, it's a very big part of my life. I've been skiing since I learned how to walk and that goes the same for a lot of kids who live here. I mean, if you're a local here, everyone knows how to ski. So, and so it's it's more of an activity. It's not it's not like a destination thing. Like, oh, we're gonna get in a plane and fly somewhere and go skiing. It's it's just something you do when you have free time. Yeah, for us. I mean, I ever since I think it started in kindergarten, we we, we do this thing called ski PE. So instead of PE during the winter, we go and ski twice a week. Wow. Um, Thursday and Friday afternoon with our class and our teachers. So it's just like a fun environment. You get better at skiing. And then we have a lot of ski racers. So, I mean, skiing is a very big part of Telluride's community and environment. Wow. I've spent most of my life avoiding sharks and skis because <laughs> I, I don't want to I don't know if there's an afterlife, Ayla, but I don't want to have to tell somebody I was either eaten by something or that I hit a tree and that's why I'm dead. And so I just think it would sound silly if that was my story going out. Um, uh, but I have never it, once in my life stood on skis. And my wife has been trying for t as long as I've known her. She's like, go skiing. Come on, we'll go. And I was like, I don't want to hit a tree. <laughs> and so I'm a big baby. Ayla. Um, and I told you this was going to shake out where you were going to be the adult in the conversation. So um, I, I think it's really cool that you, so are you like, do you ski like, I don't know, like, 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 are you like, do you go really fast or are you like tepid about it? How do you, what would you say your level of like ski expertise is? Yeah, I ski really fast. I can ski anything on the mountain. Um, I, really enjoy hiking and then skiing with friends where you go and put your skis on your back and you just hike it in your ski boots and then you ski down. So that's, that's really fun. It's that it sounds amazing. Like you're describing something that I think to myself, I wish I wanted to try that. But then it's also coupled with one of the worst things in the world, in my opinion, uh, cold. So I, I don't know. <laughs> such a baby. I'm like, oh God, it's cold and there are trees standing still while you're going fast. The whole thing sounds very dangerous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but not to you. That's really great. How was your, um, does your management change much when you're skiing or when you're not? 
Like, how do you um, manage your diabetes during the, this game? When I ski, it's different than other sports I do because you're only skiing for a short little time and then you're sitting on a chairlift. So when I'm hiking and then skiing, my blood sugar generally does drop. But when I'm just leisurely skiing, my blood sugar tends to be pretty steady. I mean, it's not a uh, very, like, it's not a sport that takes a ton of endurance unless you're doing, like, a really hard run. Yeah. So when I'm just having fun, they tend to just stay pretty steady. I mean, I'll have a few drops and a few rises, but other than that, it's an easier sport to manage than soccer or backpacking with my class at school or whatever other sports I end up doing. Cool. So, I mean, and plus you, I'm assuming it's exciting to ski down the hill, right? So there's a little bit of adrenaline that probably helps with your blood sugar a little bit too, keeping it up a little bit while your activity pulls it down a little bit. It's probably a great balance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the cold for sure has an effect on it. Um, but I mean, if it's a really cold day, I'll put a hand warmer in my pocket with my pump Mm -hmm. so it doesn't freeze. But yeah, the cold has like a small effect on it, but it's nothing very drastic. Did you see uh, by any chance, have you ever been on my blog recently? I just put up a, a post from Chris Freeman, the Olympic skier, and he was talking about a triathlon he just did. And he, he, he showed how he prepped for it and put all of his information about his blood sugars and all the stuff. It was really cool. Um, because that's a, an amazing amount of, you know, endurance and, uh, and he knows how to do it really well because he was a cro- he was a cross country skier in the Olympics. Cool. I'll check that out. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. So you sound like you're pretty, you're pretty knowledgeable about your own care. And so how long have you, uh, are you kind of on your own most days or do you co, I don't, I almost said co-parent, but do you co-parent your diabetes with your mom or, or, or like, like, how does it work? Like you get up in the morning, do you start making decisions right away or is she helping you or how does that go? I mean, I try to take as much responsibility I can on myself mm-hmm. for it, but my parents do play a big role in my diabetes, and I really appreciate that. So I go to a small experiential school where we go on big trips with my, our classmates and focus on a certain topic. Mm-hmm. So, for example, last spring we went to Hawaii. I'm just going to tell you what I just told someone privately five minutes ago through a message. When you act quickly as your blood sugar rises... You need less insulin to stop a spike. When you use less insulin, the likelihood of a low later becomes lesser as well. So you stop the spike and avoid a low later. That's how you keep your blood sugar in a range that you're looking for. But what you really want to know is how do I know when to do that? Well, when I do it with my daughter, I look at her Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. I check out that line. And when that line starts to bend up, I can kind of tell now. This is this is a rise that's coming. And then I just bump and nudge a little bit of insulin and get that up rise to level back out and come back. So now it took a tiny little bit of insulin to stop her blood sugar from going, say, over 120. Instead of waiting till she's 180, 200, 250, or the next time I test to find out that we have a high blood sugar. Then when that happens, you're putting on a whole bunch of insulin, which eventually will become unbalanced with the impact of the carbs you've eaten or your body function. Everything gets unbalanced again and you crash low. But none of that has to happen. And if you have the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor, you can make decisions just like that. Your results may vary. These are my findings. But my oh my are they my findings. You hear me talk about it all the time. Arden's A1C between 5'2 and 6'2 for five years. Why? Omnipod and Dexcom. Dexcom.com forward slash juicebox to get started today. I grew up in an apartment complex across the street from my school. 
and uh, I just walked back and forth to it over and over again, day after day, year after year, while somebody was like, these are numbers, these are letters. And that was my whole schooling situation. How did you, where did you, this is very confusing to me. Hold on, we have to stop for a second. Why do you get to go to Hawaii? What is your school, is it, is it like, I don't even understand. <laughs> I don't even have a question because I don't understand. But it's very normal to you. When you say it's an experiential school, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that you really take education out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So your classes are really small. There's about six people in my grade. So super small. Mm -hmm. You get to really know everybody. And so you take the education out of the classroom and do more hands-on learning and really just experience whatever you're learning in a completely different way. That's amazing. What did you learn in Hawaii besides Hawaii is beautiful? We were there during the eruption of Kilauea, which is really exciting. Wow. So we focused on volcanoes and oceanography, marine biology, and geography. This wasn't just your, your teacher wanted to go to Hawaii, right? No. No, okay. <laughs> There's an old actor um, who you don't know probably named uh, Michael... He's a British guy. Now I can't remember his name. All right. Well, that part will come to me. He was Alfred in some of the old Batman movies, which are even too old for you to know, probably. But I saw this interview with him once, and, and somebody asked him how he picked his roles. And he said, in the cold months, I pick a movie that's filmed somewhere warm. And in the warm mm -hmm. months, I pick a movie that's filmed somewhere cold. And I thought, Wow. That's a pretty basic concept, but it seems to be serving him pretty well. Um, and so I just thought maybe your teacher was like, hey, what do we got to get off this mountain? Where should we go? Hawaii sounds good. That's really beautiful. Like, that's like, what do you want to do when you, I hate to, this is such a, a, a very lame question to ask a kid, but what, do you have any idea what you want to do when you get older? I want to do something in the medical field. Do you think the type one has any impact on you wanting to do that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So do you like helping other people or do you appreciate the feeling that people helping you so much that you want to do it for somebody else? Both. So in my school there in the last year, there's one other diabetic who got diagnosed mm -hmm. and she's going into fourth grade. And so my dad works at my school. He's my art teacher mm -hmm. and her mom works at our school also. And she's going to be my history teacher. So, I mean, it's a very small community, and yeah. since you do go on these experiential trips and you're diabetic, my parents have always come with me, and in the long run, I appreciate it, but before the trips, it's, it's a different experience because none of my friends or classmates have a parent come with them, Okay. but in the long run, I'm grateful for my parents and that they do love me so much and support me that they do come on these trips, even though I want that freedom it's just a, because I'm growing up. Yeah, but. It, it's a difficult line to walk to because just this last school year, um, Arden's, Arden's class, you know, school trip went to, it was like, it was a theme park around here, you know, with roller coasters and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a, a chaperone. One, because I really just didn't want to ride all the way somewhere on a bus with a bunch of kids making a lot of noise. And if you're a chaperone, you have to go on the bus. But still, I felt like I needed to go to help Arden so Arden could kind of have like a free and easy day without thinking about her diabetes too much. So I contacted the school and I was like, okay, I'm going to come, but I'm going to drive up on my own and, you know, I'm just going to be there. So the minute I got there, I ended up chaperoning her group anyway. And because it was such a big group that the person who was chaperoning, it was like, if we just split these kids in half, they'll be able to do more and go on rides quick, you know, more quickly. So I did that. I had a great time, but the entire time I thought about like, how do I stay away from her? Like, how do I, how, how can I be here without really being like, you know, upper butt and making her feel like I'm watching her all the time? Cause I wasn't, and I didn't want her to feel that way. So I just sort of hung back as much as I could and, and interjected, you know, in the times when it, you know, it called for it. But about halfway through the day, one of her friends was like, you know, you should come on the rides with us. 
And I said, I no, it's you guys. And they're like, no, come. So then, like the last half of the day, I went on roller coasters with everybody, and so I waited for them to. And it wasn't like I didn't look sad. I, you know, I had things to do. I was busy and things like that. I kept myself busy. I didn't stand around moping that I was bored. Um, and I found that like when they were ready, they were happy to have somebody along with them. They just didn't want to feel like it had to happen. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but. Uh, yeah, a, I think it's experience. just part of growing up with diabetes yeah. is that your parents are going to be looking out for you. So like it or not, that's what they're going to do because they want to help you and make sure that you're in the best hands possible. Of course. And and how did the trip go for you with your type one? Pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of snorkeling and swimming. So mm-hmm. that was a little bit of a challenge because them, you had to disconnect and everything, so that's why the Omnipod where the Omnipod would, would have been better. Be for a you. different story for that trip, but the pump worked really well on the trip, and my dad came, and it was actually a really great experience yeah. and time with him. And so I really enjoyed after all that he did come, and I hope that one day I can go on a trip myself. And just get that experience that all my friends get. So maybe this year. Well, do you imagine that is soon? You know, I mean, where? How? So listen. Here, we'll, we'll start with this. We're halfway through talking already. It's, we're going. It's doing really great. Um, and so you you listen to the podcast, right? You've had diabetes for five years, but your mom's had diabetes for much longer. So I imagine that when you were diagnosed, your mom kind of already had a plan. Like she knew how to do things from from herself. Yes. Yeah. She actually, she was the one who diagnosed me. She checked my blood sugar one night and yeah. So I guess my, my thought was prior to the podcast, you weren't struggling with your, like, how was your, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but how, how was your management? Like, was your blood sugar reasonably stable? You're not scared of things. Like you were looking for more community when you found the podcast, not, not management ideas, right? No. I mean, it's just the highs and lows. That's about it. Mm-hmm. Some highs, some lows, and some in between. So, do you, in the course of a day, you know, like for instance, where does your CGM tell you you're high and low? I put mine since I'm in auto mode on like a really tight one. So my low is at like eighty, and my high is at one hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. So. And so when you hear, when, when you go above 150, do you say, oh, the pump will take care of it? Or do you ever have to intervene? Um, sometimes you can't correct because it's working for you. Mm-hmm. So if you, if I look at my graph right now, I've been in range most of the day so far and last night. And you, it has all these little purple dots at the top of the graph saying where it's done the work for me. Okay. So there's sometimes when you say I'm eating and this is how much insulin I want, or do you tell it like I have a, like I'm having a big meal or a small meal or how does it work when you're eating? When I'm eating, I still need to do the bolus things. So all it does is it gives me more insulin when I'm approaching high. Mm -hmm. So I don't get high. I mean, I still go to 300 every once in a while. Um, And then it slowly turns my insulin and basal off as I'm going low. So I don't get to that really low, low. Okay. Did it confuse it when you took it off to go snorkeling? The sensor went out of range. So it just took a few minutes to get back in range. Right. But one time snorkeling, I was probably a good half mile out at a reef and started feeling low. And I had to swim myself back in because I didn't have my sensor on to see what I was and I didn't have any snacks on me. So that was a good lesson to put a pack of shot blocks or something in my bathing suit or something that I can just quickly eat if I am out there. Yeah. Was it scary? Did you ever feel panicky or did you just say, Oh, I got to get back. It was a little scary at the end. I had a friend swim me in. So it was, it was scary for sure because you're just, out there in the middle of the ocean and you're starting to feel low and it's like that low panicky feeling. So plus you don't want to be eaten by a shark eventually. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Or ski into a tree. It's 
<laughs> well, that's amazing. It sounds like you handled it really well. And I think that that's a, a you know, a, a, a good thing for people to hear is that, you know, especially when, when, when parents see kids who are younger, who are more newly diagnosed, every blood sugar that looks, you know, a little low panics people. And it, it doesn't need to most of the time, you know, and even when you're in a situation that's really panicky where you're getting really low, you still need to hold yourself together. Like that's when you have to make good decisions and, you know, and not freak out because it's important not to freak out at this point. Like I'm, Arden is, I mean, you'd probably be mortified because you seem like a very active child, but Arden is a sleeping in, in the summer kind of person. She stays up really late. I am too. Okay. And she sleeps in, <laughs> in the summer. So she's still asleep right now. And her blood sugar is 72. It's nice and stable, and I can actually see it on my screen right now while we're talking, but I, I, it's fine. If she was to go to 65, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't go, oh, my God, I have to go. Ayla, I have to because Arden's blood sugar, you know, I just would be like, oh, okay. Well, we'll have to do something about that. You, you, you know, like, it's, it's, um, it's good to stay composed, and I don't think that there's any better training for staying composed than having some flippers on a half a mile from the shore when you realize that you feel a little dizzy. Um what, do you know what your blood sugar was while you were out there? Did you ever figure it out or did you just come back in and do something about it? I came back in, I ate a lot of food and it was like one of those lows where I ate and then I checked because I felt so low. Mm -hmm. And after I had like a cliff bar and a shop block, I was 50 something. So yeah. I was probably low 50s when I was out there or high 40s. Is that about Not where exactly you feel like sure. that always? That number? What? Is that number about when you feel like that to begin with usually? Yeah, I start feeling my lows around 65 sometimes, mm -hmm. but other times I never, I don't feel my lows at all. It just goes and it's, it's normal. I got, uh, the other night I was asleep and Arden was sitting up, I'm assuming watching something on Netflix and, um, she appears to love that Netflix in a very unhealthy way. But, but I got, a, <laughs> I got a text from her and it just said, I feel a little dizzy. And so, you know, sure enough, she was, and we just did some basal adjustments and she ate a little bit, or I think she drank something and she went right back to, I went right back to sleep and she went right back to what she was doing. Um, it's, it's really, it's cool that you're, that you're so calm and collected about that. So when you listen to the podcast, is there ever things that are talked about that you think, oh, I do that? Or do you ever think, oh, I've never heard of that before? Or what's your experience mainly when you hear people talking about management? Has something popped up that's really been valuable to you? I've only listened to a few of your podcasts. Okay. I'm excited to listen to more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everyone's story is different and alike in the same way. And everyone has like a moral of their story. So I guess the moral of my story is like, even when you are diabetic, you can still go out and do these epic adventures and, you know, go snorkeling or go backpacking and do these crazy things that some people would be like, oh yeah, you're diabetic. There's no way you could do that. Like there's a way to do everything, even if you're going to be a little high or a little low. So there we were last week in the afternoon after school, trying to get every last unit of insulin out of Arden's pump. It was about to expire. We knew it had been on for the full three days, but there was like eight units left. And I said, let's keep it on the whole way. Let's try to get everything out of it. So I rush off to the post office to mail a couple of things. And while I'm out, Arden texts me, hey, my pod just ran out of insulin. So I said, okay, change it. I'm on my way home, but just get started. I was... I don't know, five, seven minutes away from my house. And when I got home, I thought, okay, let me go in and see if I can help her. And I came through the door and I said, hey, I'm here. Let me, let me give you a hand. And she said, I'm done. It's finished already. Can you change your insulin pump in a couple of minutes? Is the process of changing your insulin pump so easy you'd let a child do it while they were home by themselves? If you had an Omnipod, you would. Because my goodness, is it easy to do. Self-inserting no tubes. You don't have to prime all the way through a tube. It's just, it's so simple. The person who made the Omnipod must have sat down and thought, how do I make this a perfect experience for people living with type 1 diabetes? So that when they go skiing or scuba diving, they don't have to take their insulin pump off. So that when it's time to change their pump, it doesn't take a half an hour and isn't an incredible headache. 
but you don't have to believe me. You can try it for yourself. Go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. There you can get a free, no obligation demo of the Omnipod. And after you try it on and wear it for a while, if you decide you want one, just contact them back and let them know. That gets the ball rolling. It's that easy. What's the key to doing those things, do you think? Is it preparation or is it is it like prepping before? Is it being ready during? Do you think it's a mix of those two? I think it's all of it. I mean, you can be 120 one second and then all of a sudden be dropping and be 85. So, I mean, just ha- being prepared and having something in your pocket and, you know, really understanding how you feel and your body and your symptoms for being high and low are really important but to go do any kind of adventure you know you're even if you're not diabetic you're gonna run into like a little conflict of course hey so using the snorkeling experience as a as a a jumping in point for this idea when you were getting ready to snorkel out in that that time where you got low and you had to come back before you left the shore did you think I'm snorkeling away without any kind of sugar with me. Did it occur to you or did it, were you just excited to go and you just went, did you check your blood sugar before you went? Like what was the leading up to that? Yeah. So it was my first time snorkeling on that trip. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I think like 210 beforehand and I'd been told by some people and I mean, everybody's body is different. So you do whatever you have to do, but because you have to disconnect from the Medtronic, I was told that it's good to give like, I don't know, 0.3 of a correction just so you don't spike. Right. So me and my dad talked about that and pretty sure that's what we did. And so I was like, yeah, 210, I'm fine. And then probably 45 minutes in, I just started to feel pretty low and start swimming back. That kicking is a lot of effort. And for anybody who's never snorkeled, um, you're just constantly kicking your legs. It's, it, you know, it, it pretty much doesn't stop. How was the snorkel? I've only ever snorkeled in the Caribbean. How was it in Hawaii? Was it pretty amazing? At that beach we went to, it was called 69 Beach, so we went to the Big Island. Mm-hmm. Um, that reef was pretty much dead. Oh. So we were looking at dead coral and just what has been affecting that and then we went to captain cook which is another snorkeling area where you hike about a mile in okay and that was very beautiful it was like the most pristine blue water you've seen and the coral was all different colors and there were so many different colors fish and it was beautiful the first time you ever saw something like that no, no, in part not you- like that. I've we went to a lot of dead reefs just to like see that global warming is affecting that and to make observations. And then when we went to this alive reef, it was like this is what it actually looks like. Like this is gorgeous. So it's crazy, right? It's just it's yeah. It is one of the more beautiful things that I've ever seen. My <clears throat> excuse me, my son and I were snorkeling off of a small bay in St. John a number of years ago. And this, it got a little overcast. So, you know, under the water gets darker. And we're together and we're looking around and we look up and this giant mass is coming at us. So I, all I can see is something that is round and I'm not kidding you, like 20, 25 feet across. And it did strike me for a second. I thought, oh, well, at least we'll die together, you, you, you know, because it was this thing looked like this big, solid thing coming at us, and and there was nowhere to go, there was nothing to do, and as it got closer and closer and closer, it ended up being a school of puffer fish. Oh wow! And it it is it remains one of the just most wonderful things I think I've ever seen with my own eyes. It was yeah. really something else. After the panic of uh, certain death went away. I, I was really able to appreciate it <laughs> after that. Um, and as they came up to us, they separated. And so you were sort of in and around it and it was, it was really spectacular. Like I'm really, um, I think it's really cool that you got to see that, especially with school because, yeah. because my daughter saw Hershey park this year, which, um, <laughs> does not sound as cool if I'm being honest. Um, Hmm. How long have you been, are you, you and your sister, right? 
Yeah. How old's your sister? She is going to be 11 in a few weeks. Okay. Do you find her to be irritating or do you like her? I like her a lot. Very nice. Look at you. You guys are a, a really great family, it seems like. Either that or you've been taught very well how to lie about things. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think <laughs> you, and so, yeah, our family is very tight. Yeah, no kidding. It really comes across that way. Um, so your dad's a teacher. Okay. Your mom is? My mom is working in Telluride to make all of Telluride carbon neutral. Of course she is. And Go ahead. <laughs> She's also a life coach. <laughs> no kidding. To make Telluride carbon neutral. All right. And so, and you want to do something in the medical field. Like when you get older, do you want to be a doctor, a nurse? Do you want to be some other kind of practitioner? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, I want to be a surgeon. But we'll see how that goes. Well, that's, first of all, that's really cool. And let me tell you something that I think you'll find hopeful. Um, my neighbor literally next door to my house. When I moved in, when I, my family and I moved in here, my son was two, Arden wasn't born. And my neighbor had these sets of twins, two sets of twins, which I think might be unlucky. I'm not sure what, the, how people think about that, but he had a older set and a younger set, obviously in the younger set, the boy, there was a boy and a girl. The boy was, I don't know how old they must've been like 10 when I moved in or something like that. And, um, I saw him the other day. And he is on his way to, uh, I think, Penn down in, in Philadelphia. He's the orthopedic, um, like, I don't know, like he got the one orthopedic surgery spot in Penn coming out of medical school. Wow. And, and so he was just some like dopey kid running around in my backyard for a long time. And, and now he's a surgeon. So it's very doable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like if anybody could figure out how, it would be you. Thank you. Let me take a drink here, but you're very welcome. How do you think this is going so far, by the way? I think it's good. Yeah? Yeah. I do, too. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you're like, I wish we were talking about it? Um, no, I don't. I'm doing pretty good then, right? I'm pretty good at this. Ayla, I've been doing this for a while now. Thank you. So uh, what kind of insulin do you use? I use Novolog. Novolog works okay for you? Yeah, I used to use a Pedra, and now I use Novolog. I think they work the same, but... Yeah. You're having a similar experience with them? Yeah. That's excellent. Um, Arden has a much better experience with the Pedra than she did with Novolog, but um, it's good. It, it just it highlights that it's good to try things and you know, yeah, try to figure out what is. works best for you. So let's see. So you have a lot of kids in a small community that have type 1. Did you say yes. 6? There are, no, there's me and then a now-to-be senior, a now-to-be ninth grader, and a now-to-be fourth grader. So you guys so are spread out in age pretty well. Yeah. So are you friendly? To, yeah, me and the fourth grader go to the same small school, and then the other two go to the public school, which is like five minutes away. Okay, but you guys, all know, you guys all know each other, though. Yes. Do you talk about diabetes or do you, or do you like when you get together is, do, do you not? And does get together just mean Snapchat? What, what does it mean when you're 14 exactly? Um, me and the fourth grader, her, her name is Belle. Mm-hmm. And I would say we are the closest because we go to the same school yeah. and she has been diabetic for a little over a year. She got diagnosed like a week after my diagnosis, but four years later. And she now has an Omnipod. She now goes to the summer camp I go to in California run by GYF. So I think because we go to such a small school, we're really looking out for each other and all the teachers are looking out for us. And it's just a really good community where you feel very welcome and safe. So I think I'm closest with her. I don't know the senior that well, and I know the other ninth grader, sort of. She doesn't go to my school. I did track with her for a year, well, like for like a season. Um, But yeah, I'd say the other girl that goes to my school, I'm for sure closest to. She's the one you're talking with. Do you guys talk about your diabetes ever? Um, yeah. Is it yeah. more of a, like a, hey, 
what would you do about this? Is it more of just sort of a support thing, like a private kind of, this is how I feel? I'd say a little bit of both. Yeah. Going to such a small school that there's now two diabetics and both of us have a parent who works at the school. It Everyone really looks out for you. Like Everyone is starting to know the symptoms of highs and low blood sugar. So everyone's just really looking out for you. Um, so, I mean, I'm always carrying an extra low snack in case she needs one or, you know, helping her mom out if her mom wants to go on a bike ride or something like that. So it's a really great small support system and community. Ayla, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not sure if you're going to be comfortable answering or if you're even going to know the answer to it. Um, but do you, do you ever get, like down about it does it ever is it ever feel like too much having diabetes um i mean it has its moments where you've been high all day and you're just frustrated and over it but i mean i think a lot of good has come out of diabetes in the long run just just sort of learning like I, i i think that too i think there's a lot of value that comes out of struggle you know of any kind and and so you just, do you feel just more prepared for things and less? Yeah, like, less... I feel more confident about myself and I know my body a lot better than a lot of my friends know their bodies. Mm-hmm. And I know like my boundaries and I know I have really good willpower and I just, I feel like diabetes has given me a lot of really good life lessons and things that I'll take with me for the rest of my life. So, but yeah, it has its moments where you're just, tired and you know not really feeling like giving your 10th correction to come down and change your sight again but I mean that's what you have to do that's what you have to do do you when when it when that when that happens do you commiserate with your mom or with a friend or do you just sort of handle it by yourself do you have a way that you like to cope um I talk to my friends all I'd say a lot of my closest friends are from diabetes camp. So everyone there really gets it and understands. So I talk to my friends and I talk to my mom. I'm really close with both my mom and my dad. So that's a benefit. Like that's really helpful. Well, that's really, that's wonderful. I just, I'm thinking about Arden and the people she knows who have diabetes and and how they, um, you know, interact. And then I realize that I don't, I'm not always with her when they're talking. I don't know what they're always talking about. So it's just interesting to hear it from your perspective, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Well, okay. So future surgeon Ayla, um, who's been to Hawaii and like 9,000 other places who skis and snorkels and goes and speaks at events. Are you, I mean, is there something you haven't done that you want to do? Um, I mean, I play a lot of soccer. That's a big part of my life. Isn't it hard I to play was, soccer on the side of a hill? I'm, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just like kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> you understand, I've never been where you live. So in my mind, you're just in ski chalets on one like big pointy mountain. Um, uh-huh. but I'm assuming it's not exactly like that, though. <laughs> Yeah. You, you do you like soccer? Are you like you play travel or for your? I guess you can't play for your school. There's like six kids in your grade, but um, I will play for the public school this next year. So for high school, and then I play on a club team that travels, and I'm about to try out for ODP again, which is the Olympic Development Program. Mm-hmm. So well, we'll see how that goes. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll go great. Um, and it's really cool that you're trying. So what I I know very little about soccer other than it really seems boring to me. And I'm sure it's not for people who love it, but what position do you play? Do you, are you on defense or offense? Do you make the ball not go into the net? Which do you do? I play forward. So I'm up there scoring goals. A lot of running? Yes. Jeez. I feel like if I asked you anything, you'd have a good answer to it that I'd be surprised. Have you ever been on the space shuttle? No. See, see, I found something you haven't done, Ayla. That's fine. Um, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I, I don't often 
I mean, I, you don't often find kids, and I don't mean to just talk about you like you're like a kid, but you're not. But, but I'm just saying you don't often find people your age who are so clear minded when they're speaking. Um, it's and and so um, supported in their confidence, but yet the confidence seems deserved. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not just running around like I can do anything I want. You actually are doing things. Um, and there's a big difference from believing in yourself and not trying and trying. And that's why you believe in yourself. Um, it, it's, I didn't expect, like when I got your email, I did say, I remember I said to my wife, I'm like, I'm, I'm setting up, a an interview with a girl who's 14 who has type one. I was like, but when she's writing, she seems like she's older in, you know, and then and I was like, I wonder if her mom's helping her with this or what this, but you are, you are exactly how you seemed in your emails and very impressive. Um, Thank you. You're, no, you're, you're very welcome. But I, I, I'm, um, I don't know how to ask this. Is your sister have that same level? Like, is this a family trait or do you really think that diabetes helped you put you in this situation? I don't want to paint your sister like she's just fumbling around and not capable. Well, I don't think that I'm just saying, is this a learned behavior or is it nature nurture? Like a little bit of both. What do you think it is? Would you like to assist dancing with diabetes in their mission to elevate awareness about the realities of living with type one? And would you like to help them raise funds to assist in finding a cure? Go to dancingfordiabetes.com. That's dancing, the number four, diabetes.com. And please check them out on Instagram and Facebook. I think it's both. Diabetes has really helped me become a lot more mature, but my sister is also very mature. She's very responsible. She's extremely smart. Like, she's just really, like, in the moment, I guess. Yeah. Which I really appreciate. Like she's a very good sister and she really tries to understand as much as she can about the diabetes and just anything. Like she puts all or none effort into anything she does, which is really inspiring. So, yeah. Hey, I have a quick question for you. Somebody just asked me the other day and it's not something I ever heard of, but they said they had problems managing their blood sugar at higher elevations. You would know about this. Does that have any effect on your blood sugar? Yeah. So, I mean, living up here, I don't really know any better, right. but going down in elevation, um, like I go to summer camp in California, so that's practically sea level and I'm up at 8750. So I'm up there for sure in the elevation. But I mean, this last year at camp, my blood sugars were pretty much the same as they were at home. But I do think that coming back up into elevation it does have like a small effect. I I think I go a little higher for like a day or two, and then it regu- it regulates out again. So you you don't have to actually have to make a, like adjustments to basal right. rates or something like that. You just need a little more insulin when you first get back up to the elevation. Yeah, I mean, I know I've heard people say, "Oh yeah, I need to change all my basals. Like I need a lot more insulin mm-hmm. up at elevation." So it but does for affect me, I some think people that way. Yeah. Living here my entire life, yeah, I that's just it's pretty common. It's for okay. Me. It's, yeah, it's yeah. just the way I've been living with diabetes the entire time, so I don't really know any better. That's cool. All right. Um, okay, so we're sort of coming up to the end here. Uh, is there? I, I I feel we. I usually ask people if like they want to share their Instagram or something like that. But you're 14, so I don't even know if that's okay or not. Um, but but it's um. But is there? Is there anything you have coming up that you can tell me about? Like, are you going to do any more speaking or? I hope so. I don't have anything planned, um, but I would love to. So. Well, people will hear this. Maybe someone will find you through this. That would be nice. Yeah. I get some speaking through this, so maybe you should too. Yeah. I make them pay me though, Ayla. Do you make them pay you when you go somewhere? I didn't for this one because they paid the fees for like our airfare and our hotel so Mm -hmm. that was i think that was what they were going to pay me but instead they just put it in our travel travel. i don't actually ask for very much i'm i just like to i just like it not to cost me anything you know if i if i go speak somewhere i it's usually for an organization that's you know nonprofit 
or charitable and you don't want to ask them for you know a bunch of money they're trying to make money and I'm always happy to go out, but I always just say, look, it can't cost me anything. I don't want to come home having said, wow, this weekend cost me $500. Like, like I don't, you know, so I just ask for enough just to make sure that I, I get back and forth. Okay. I just really like, you know, to commiserate with you for a second and about it. I really just, I enjoy uh, meeting new people and, you know, doing my best to try to explain you know, what it is we talk about here on the podcast in real life and, and just give them an opportunity to see, like you said, a different perspective and, and see if it's something that strikes them as valuable for them. Um, and, and hopefully leave them with a little more hope and, um, you know, and tools than, than maybe they showed up with that day. So that, that's what I like. What did you talk about in those last couple of minutes here? Tell me, what did you talk about in your speech? I talked about how diabetes camp has really, helped me grow as a diabetic and that if you never sent your child to diabetes camp, like how amazing it is and how it really does help on so many different levels. Mm-hmm. And then I talked about soccer and the new 670 pump, which actually broke the day of the gala, which was <laughs> pretty inconvenient, but Medtronic, I, if you want to buy some ads, get in touch with me now. We can tell more stories about how your pump breaks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, it actually broke while you were there, while you were telling people about it? It broke like a few hours right before the gala. Oh, no kidding. What did you do? We tried to – we didn't have any Lantis with us, which is sort of our problem. Mm-hmm. But I'd had the pump for like six weeks. So we're like, yeah, there's no way it's going to break. Like what? it's brand new. It's a great pump, yeah. and all of a sudden it was just sending us an error that it, we called Medtronic. They're like, "Yeah, it's, it's dead." <laughs> so you're not far yeah, from home or anything, are you? No, no, I'm fine. Don't worry. But you, did you bum insulin off? Of, there must have been plenty of diabetics there, right? Yeah. So luckily, I was speaking at a diabetes fundraiser, which was really helpful. So I had known quite a few people there through camp as counselors and as friends. So one of the counselors, she just gave me some Lantis and then they 24 hours shipped a new pump to our hotel. Wow. That's very cool. Well, it, it sounds like they took care of it very quickly. Uh, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, listen, they're a really good company. Like they're really helpful. I, I absolutely but. believe that. I, I, I listen, technology is what it is. It stops working sometimes and you have to be, that's part of the game. You know what I mean? If you're going to, Use a pump, use a glucose monitor. You're going to have to know that sometimes it's not going to work exactly the way you want it to or the way even that it should. And you have to, that's part of having diabetes with technology is you have to learn how exactly. to exist with it. You know what I mean? Like it's not, nothing's perfect. I have, looking around my house, there are plenty of electrical things in my house and, you know, and mechanical things. And I don't think one of them has worked perfectly the entire time I've had them. It's just, it's not the nature of, of, you know what technology is at this point and at this you know at this juncture in history it's getting better but it's still it still is what it is you know so i think it sounds like you handled it really well actually good for you yeah, yeah. it worked out well absolutely as did this episode ayla i think now but we didn't ever hit on something that we could really call the episode maybe we did i remember there was a moment where i thought that could be the title but now it's not coming back to me oh you know what it is This is a nice way to end. I have to find it. Hold on one second. I'm going to pull up your emails. Right? And I want people to know that that when Ayla has a sign-off on her email that says, with happiness, which is (laughs) just really wonderful. Did you come up with that by yourself? Yeah, I think so. How long has it been like that? Because you make me happy when you email me. I'm like, oh, thank you. I have somebody sent me happiness and, uh, and I feel it when I get it. Like, I like, that's really like it would, I, I just wouldn't have occurred to me to do that, but it did to you. And, and that's really, I think indicative of you as far as I can tell in this entire conversation, like you just have a really great attitude. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, you're, you're, it's very impressive. And, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing with everybody. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. What are you gonna do for the rest of the day? Ski on something? No. no, it's nice and sunny. Yeah. I don't know. I think I might go into town and 
some friends. I'm not really sure. Very cool. You are fantastic. I wish you were my. I'm not. Gonna, I'm just gonna say this right now. I would trade you for Arden. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Sight unseen. I'd make the swap right now. I'm not saying Arden's bad. I'm just saying you're pretty good. And I could use. Uh, I could use more happiness. I'm gonna make Arden say things like this to me now. Can I make her do it, or do you think she has to do it on her own? I don't know. <laughs> It was like, maybe you could force her to. I don't think it would be the same thing if I said, hey, when you see me, address me with happiness. Um, Because then I would always know she was just doing it because I told her to. All right. Hey, listen, real quick. Favorite television show? Uh, Probably Grey's Anatomy. Oh, Arden loves Grey's Anatomy. (laughs) Have you watched it multiple, multiple times? Yeah. Yeah, so has she. She spent a whole summer watching it over and over. What is it about Grey's Anatomy, do you think? I don't know. Just the adrenaline rush. I I like that. You like all that moving? Yeah. I referenced yeah. it the other day uh, when I was interviewing with somebody, which people will hear months from now. Uh, but um, I, I always tease my wife. I'm like, the Grey's Anatomy is my favorite show on television. But I always say it with just enough sarcasm that my wife has absolutely no idea if I actually like it or if I'm watching it because she's watching it. And I never want her to know. I always want her to wonder if I really like it or not. I don't know why. It's my, it's my Grey's Anatomy game that I play. Um, uh-huh. I'm, I'm very bad with the character names. So when I describe them, I'm always like, you know, the one in the plane crash that, you know, died. And then Arden's like, this one? And I'm like, that sounds right, but I don't really know. Grey's Anatomy. Interesting. I can't believe you said that. Arden's going to be thrilled that you said that when I tell her. <laughs> Do you like One Tree Hill by any chance? Never heard of it. All right, good. Stay away from that. It ruined a whole uh, week of my wife's life when Arden wanted to go to a One Tree Hill convention and they actually went. Hey, well, I have had a very good time talking to you. I'm glad that you enjoyed it as well. I, I'm going to say goodbye. All right. Thank you for having me. How delightful was Ayla? Thanks so much for coming on the show and telling us all about your life and school that lets you go to Hawaii, which still baffles my mind today thank you also to real good foods dancing for diabetes dexcom and omnipod for sponsoring the show please go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box dexcom.com forward slash juice box dancing the number four diabetes or use the offer code juice box at realgoodfoods.com to save 10 percent on your entire order And don't forget, if you're in the Arizona area and you want to come to the Type 1 Nation event that I'll be speaking at on February 23rd, go to juiceboxpodcast.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, click on events, and there's a link there for you to RSVP. See you next week.